So without further ado, um, Joseph Roberts here is here. He is the EGIS team lead for the city of Memphis, and they are currently working on getting all of their data silos, um, obviously not being siloed, um, and working on becoming a smart city. Thank you, Michelle. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Roberts. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I am the EGIS team lead um, for the City of Memphis Information Technology Division Department. I never realized how long that was um, until I just said it. So um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be presenting on GIS integrations, uh, City of Memphis vehicle to becoming a smart city. Uh, when I first read that title, I thought, it's like, I hope nobody thinks we're doing like smart vehicles or like AI or anything. Uh, it was kind of misleading. So, um, but today we'll be talking about GIS integrations and how they um, have the potential to be pushing the city of Memphis to becoming a smart city. So, um, today I'm going to share my screen. All right. <clears throat> Can everyone see my screen? I'll uh, just no, put yeah, not yet. We not yet. Not yet. Okay, I'll try to share again. All right, now we can see it. All right, good. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so um, today we're going to be talking about GI the title of the presentation is GIS Integrations, City of Memphis Vehicle to Becoming a Smart City. So before I jump into any of this, um, one second. Before I jump into any of this, I want to take the time to introduce my team, because without them, um, we couldn't be doing any of this, um, as well as a lot of previous developers, some that may be in here, um, that assisted with the, um, the, the development of some of these applications, as well as some of the, the groundwork for, um, for the work that I'm going to be showcasing today. Um, I, right now, we are a team of four um, that we manage a lot of different applications, but my team is um, Abhinav Tamala. He's been with the city for four years, specializing in integration and development. Um, then we have Raghu uh, Dentakurthy. He is our, our architecture and GIS administrator. And then we have Vijay Ganti, who is our custom development and integration specialist. These guys are amazing. Um, they do a lot of different things, work outside the box, and uh, they really kind of push the department to do uh, some, some very cool things. So, so why are we here today? So today, uh, the purpose of our presentation is to exhibit how GIS integrations could potentially be the vehicle that transports the city of Memphis to a smart city. Now, that sounds kind of a bold statement, um, kind, of, <laughs> kind of a bold statement, but we definitely, the city of Memphis GIS team doesn't feel like it is, mainly because three main factors. So the supporting factors uh, that why we feel that we could be the vehicle to become a smart city, uh, take the city of Memphis to a smart city, is one, um, our roles and relationships. Uh, we support a lot of different departments and um, in the city of Memphis, and we host and we ho um, host and hold all of their data. And so we'll go into deeper detail of that. We also have a lot of different integrations. So um, today I'll be showcasing four of our integrations that kind of help the department advance their, um, advance their data and actually add more context to their data so they can work in a more efficient manner. And also we'll be discussing the SMART, um, SMART Memphis plan and how GIS's core values align with, core values and actions align with um, the SMART Memphis plan. So, um, so as, as I stated, the first factor of why we feel that we can become the vehicle of um, becoming, making the city of Memphis a smart city is enterprise GIS team, our role in the city. So what do we, we develop? We do, well, our main thing that we develop are work order management systems. So work order management systems um, allow this, each department to uh, manage, support, uh, manage, support, and report on activities and work that's being done in the field. <clears throat> so GIS's role in that, we, we go we go out to the, um, the departments, we work with the customers, uh, we understand their workflows and business, um, and business pain points. And then we also, um, once we take that information, come back to our office, we kind of put some workflows together, run it by them. And then we develop these suite of applications, um, field and desktop applications that allow them to track, manage, 
and report upon the information that has been done. Now, was, as we all know, um, when you move to a web-based uh, platform, all that, that data is in sync and moving back and forth. So the uh, administrator staff is able to tell what's been going on in the field while also being able to aggregate all of that data up to, to uh, make more data-driven decisions. So um, as you can see, the departments we serve, we serve over 10 plus departments, um, some of them, most of them being in code um, in public works and in engineering. And also we uh, do a lot of other cool stuff. So to make other, uh, a lot of other cool stuff that this isn't a wild work order management systems, which includes, um, we do data, data analytics. Um, we also, which includes like 3D modeling, live reporting, um, spatial correlations and geoprocessing custom um, purpose driven applications. So our property maintenance application is a completely uh, in-house developed application. And we also do uh, a workflow automation. Now, what's cool about, going, going back to this, what's cool about these work order management systems is that they, they garner a lot of data. So um, some of the stats of the work order management systems is that they would get over 10K updates a day from 10 different departments. Some of that, those updates include pictures, videos, and things, and we get almost like five gigabytes of data um, on average, which is a lot, um, excuse me. Um, and then we also uh, have a plethora of different applications. So with this, starting to think about like, with this much data flowing through uh, the city in a very centralized manner, it definitely puts us in a position to begin to centralize a lot of different things. And it opens the opportunity for start cross, cross analysis between these departments. What happens when you start to compare potholes and, um, and blight within a city, you can start, uh, start making data-driven decisions in regard to where your um, zones, where you need to focus your, your efforts of improvement and things of that nature. So that's one of our, another big um, initiative that the EGIS department is trying to drive is in regards to removing these data silos and starting collaborating. But on top of all of this and things that, um, all the things that we do in regards to the, the city of Memphis and, and data manipulation and data capture within the city, most importantly, we integrate. So um, integration has been um, the lifeblood of the this uh, GIS department. It's kind of the conception of the GIS department. Um, some of the, um, we'll get into why, but some of these uh, integrations that I'm gonna showcase today have stories behind them in this regards to, um, have stories behind them that kind of showcase why it's important. So the benefits of integrating um, with other systems and how GIS integrates with those systems. The biggest, uh, some of the benefits include uh, it provides more context to your existing data. Um, a lot of things, I have a joke um, that the city of Memphis will live and die on spreadsheets. And <laughs> um, every department we went to has always had a spreadsheet about something that they're capturing that's been very vital to their operation. Uh, but when you bring it into the web environment, you provide a, a context of a map and um, spatial correlation and things of that nature, it provides a lot more context. So when you start integrating with more systems, you're getting more data and provides more information. User-friendly interfaces. Some of our um, some of our integrations are just because the user, uh, the vendor, um, the department bought uh, software from the vendor. We don't like the way it interfaces, so we love the way GIS interfaces. So we will build your, um, so we integrate to build the interface to have data go back and forth. Also, um, we centralize data. Some um, some uh, departments have bought uh, bought software in which they like to you know, centralize with the GIS data and cross-reference. And so then that, like I said, kind of leads back to the first point in regards to uh, bringing more context. Centralizing this data allows you to kind of do more in-depth analysis and make more data-driven decisions. And this is kind of a benefit to us, but it facilitates growth within our department. Um, as you, there's a plethora of different, um, plethora of different softwares out there in which allow you to uh, do a plethora of different things. And with each, with us serving so many departments, we get to interface with so many different softwares that really pushes us to really stay on the edge of what, what's going on. So as these departments, I mean, as these departments evolve, we must evolve with them to stay relevant and to uh, give them the best service that we can. So today I'm gonna to walk you through four of our, our most prominent integrations that we have. Um, 
Some, some are, some support some of this in, in regards to user-friendly interfaces, some support the, the centralization of data, and some support um, provides more, I mean, um, some supports providing more context to the, the application. So we're going to start with our first one, and it's literally the first uh, integration we have, which is Lively. So um, in these um, in these PowerPoints, I'll have the the system that which we integrate it with there, and then I'll have an integration profile. Um, so the integration profile is a developer. Um, definitely want to give props to my team because they're amazing. Um, the tools that were used to to um, uh, to to create the integration, and then the purpose of it. So uh, Oracle um, is a, a the city's parent database. Um, it, it holds everything about the, the city in regards to um, finances, benefits, everything. So, uh, but what we've mainly focused on in regards to EGIS is the EBS system. And the EBS system allows citizens to report problems that they're seeing in the city. And what um, Oracle does is route those, um, route those problems to the correct department. Now, the, um, the, the conception of LiveLink was mainly because there were uh, prior to um, prior to GIS and things of that nature, there was a lot of blue tickets, these little blue tickets that will um, that will kind of come in and they would get entered in the Oracle and then there would have to be a synchronization. So, I mean, they would have to be typed in and things of that nature. So what GIS did is a lot, they built an interface for Oracle. I mean, an interface for GIS that then synchronizes with Oracle and that, that synchronization tool is called Lively. So, um, LiveLink is literally probably like the lifeblood of GIS and probably uh, a lot of people contribute to the, um, the conception of why GIS was uh, started in the city of Memphis. So what happens is a service request will come through, um, submitted through one of the many avenues that it can be, may that be 311, um, City of Memphis 311 team. There also is an application titled C Quick Fix in which citizens can download or um, access and submit a service request. And even um, City of Memphis, um, City of Memphis employees can create service requests within the field. Next, um, there is a live link code, which was developed in C-Sharp by RBJ, um, C-Sharp and .NET, um, that picks up these changes on the fives, on either system of the five. So if it's in GIS, um, if it's in GIS, it will realize there's a trigger in which we look at to find those, um, the ones that have been integrated, I mean, to find the ones that are ready to be pushed to Oracle. And if there's a change in Oracle, we just kind of realize those changes and then on the five, so for instance, if I submitted a service request right now at, at 315, what would happen, um, it would actually be picked up at 315. But if I submitted one at 316, it would be picked up at 320. So on the fives. So what happens on the fives? There are changes, all the changes are then synchronized through VJ's code through, um, and they go back and forth through the systems. Um, there is a lot, I know I make that sound very easy, but there is a lot of different code that goes and a lot of different stipulations that, um, that make sure that this handshake is complete. Um, and there are some discrepancies in regards, but we also have to reconcile those um, quite a bit. And then last but not least, the information is then updated in our web map via our RGIS service and presented on a map. So LiveLink is literally used in all of our workload and management systems because with um, the city, with Oracle being the parents, the city's parent database, um, we have to, to kind of adhere to it. So um, what does that look like? So here is, um, here's one of our conventional work order management systems. So this is actually the drain maintenance web map. So what this will do is um, pretty much show and locate all of the service requests in which drain maintenance has. Um, this is actually the new rendition of we, we just redeveloped it. Um, so this is the new rendition, but it has a lot of accurate, I mean, it has a lot of information within it, which is also accurate, but um, it has a lot of information within it and allows the, um, the administrators to kind of have a, a, quick, uh, a quick understanding of what's going on in the field and things of that nature. So here I have active work order, um, how many active service requests, we have the address of the service request number, which is huge within the city, allows them to reference it. Um, we have some um, quick queries for them so they can run very quick reports, um, things of that nature. So it'll present queries of, of a particular zone and things of that nature. Um, Smart Editor allows them to edit and update. So this is the very key information in regards to 
uh, when they need to update a service request, they just kind of simply come here, update that, and it will show the fields in which they need to update. Um, there is a live link trigger, um, as you guys can see here, uh, that we have to switch to manual, in which uh, will then be the trigger in which pushes it to um, Oracle. So that is from what happens from a kind of a field standpoint, for, from a, a kind of a back office person standpoint. The field crew is actually using Collector um, to, uh, to make these updates. So the map will look very similar to this, um, to this map that you see here. And they will use Collector. And as they're moving around in the field, they will update these service requests basically as they close them and things of that nature. Now, so as you can see, I've discovered, I mean, I have discussed the field crew, the back office team crew, and now we have to kind of step to the administrative crew. Um, so the from the administrative standpoint, they have these operation dashboards um, that allow them to um, get a very high level of what's, what's going on in the city. And right now it's loading, um, but we'll come back to that. It's time for regards to loading, but we'll come back. So that is lava. Um, so we'll go to our next integration. So <clears throat> they are one of our next integrations is Samsara. Samsara is one of our later integrations. Oh, it was actually 2020, sorry about that. Um, but it was developed by uh, Evan Atamala. And the tool that we use with GeoEvent Server and all it does is show vehicle locations. Now, I make that sound very, very simple. But the M, when we released this to the departments, it, it kind of blew them away um, because they the opened up the opportunity to, to do a lot of different things and a lot of different types of analysis. So um, the integration was uh, kind of simple. Um, so you have the Samsara uh, vehicle and it has this, Samsara is its own suite of applications. It was a very, very in-depth suite. But, um, the, the requirement here is that, hey, we just want to see it in, within our GIS. So we kept it simple. We didn't want to do all the analysis and things of that nature. So uh, we just want to see it, okay? So the Samsara VI posted the API. GeoEvent then consumes that um, service, uh, consumes that stream. And then GeoEvent server also has the ability to, to, uh, develop, uh, to showcase stream services. So these stream services don't uh, live on your ArcGIS server, actually live with on this, the um, with on, on the geo event server. And then we it posts, uh, we just basically consume that service to um, to one of our web maps. So um, what does that look like here? So oh, the dashboard loaded. So this looks like this is what it looks like. So it, from a very high extent, it doesn't look like much is going on, but when you zoom in, um, you begin to see that these vehicles are actually moving. Um, so they are moving every five seconds. And if they are moving, moving you'll see this trail of dots here. So um, this is uh, now that we have the, well, not the entire suite, but all the suite that has, um, uh, the fleet, I'm sorry. The, uh, now that we have the fleet that is uh, integrated, we can now show this on, the, on their maps. So what happens when you start to combine this with service request data? Um, so when you have the service request data for an administrator, this is starting, so you can start putting things together and piecing things together when you start showing their service requests and things of that nature. So around this, you'll start seeing a lot of yellow dots and these are pretty much active service requests. Uh, within the city, within the city. So now you give the the administrators to start asking questions um, in regards to you know you know where you know, where are you focusing your work and things of that nature. I actually got mesmerized by this application once because I was just watching this one guy just close service requests, <laughs> uh, just close service requests around the city, and it was pretty cool just to kind of kind of watch it go, you know, kind of watch it go. So uh, sorry, pretty geeky moment there, but. Um, that is the Samsara integration. So um, the, our next integration is our Google. We integrated with uh, the Google AI. So um, we actually, this is a kind of a joint collaboration between uh, a Google AI um, a model, Spring ML who implemented it and, with, uh, and uh, GIS who provided the interface for approving and denying. 
So um, this was, uh, what we provided here was pretty simple. We just provided Spring Vanilla a um, REST service URL. They pretty much did the heavy lifting. And now we are, we just do a lot of kind of cross spatial analysis to ensure that the correct data is showing up in the ref reference system. So what happens is, is a user will drive a vehicle equipped with the uh, Google video capture thing. Um, thing. And then uh, the AI, the, the Google AI detection model will review those videos and detect potholes and high grass. So these potholes requests will go to the street maintenance team uh, for review and the high grass will go for, to the code enforcement team for review. Two more ones there. So I have a third one. Um, the detection uh, uh, is then posted to the GIS REST service for evaluation. And then uh, the user will then use the GIS application to validate the detection. And there's actually two routes to this. If it's approved, a service request um, will then be created to address the issue. So, and then if it's denied, the rejections are then used to uh, improve the AI detection model. So what we have uh, two service URLs, the rejected go to a different service URL, and then um, the Spring ML, ML team will evaluate those detections um, to kind of see where, you know, where they can make improvements. So um, our biggest part here starts here, um, but I think all the cool stuff is right here, I tell my team. Um, but um, the GIS uh, evaluation application, whoops, this. So um, once the detection is detected within the application, um, it will, well, once it's sent to the, uh, the REST service, it will then um, be here for detection. So these are all the pothole requests, that pothole detections that um, the street maintenance team has um, received. So what happens here, very uh, quick application. They kind of click here, it will zoom the map there. And they have the ticket info, you know, the confidence score, and then they just click here and evaluate that. So this is actually from the, the Google AI detection um, model. And what it does is tell you like the pothole and if it's a pothole, um, and then what the team will simply do is come here, uh, review it, um, approve it. And if it's approved, it will automatically create a service request. And if it's rejected, here's that importance of a rejected reason. If it's too small, it's too shallow, um, it's utility, uh, crack the lead. You have those all those types of different rejection reasons that help improve the model. Here. Here. And um, last but not least, and probably my favorite um, of the of all these integrations is our integration with Edge Frontier, uh, developed by Mr. Abhinav Tamala and VJ Ganti in 2018. Um, so this, the call for this, uh, the tools we use are Python, C Sharp, and we also integrated with. Uh, the Edge Frontier, though. So we just kind of provided Edge Frontier service. We had to configure that as well. And what we did was we presented 911, the objective was to present 911 data on a dashboard. Um, so uh, Mr. Michael Spencer, who was the 911 communications uh, manager, um, came to us and said, hey, we want to see this data. We've seen some stuff at a conference um, that we want like to see in GIS. So we stepped up to the plate and was like, sure, we'll do this. this is definitely one of the cooler projects that, um, that we, we took on. So um, the workflow is um, a phone call is received through the best of phone system um, and then pushed in the Intergraph system. Um, Edge Frontier then prepares the data feed. Um, EGIS custom service pulls the data from Edge Frontier. The data is then stored into um, down to our SQL database, and then the ArcGIS REST service uh, presents it within a dashboard. Um, this, I think, this integration alone took probably about three months to develop. Um, where a lot of our other integrations and, and things are a lot quicker um, because they're configurable, but this one took some time. Um, but uh, it was well worth it. Um, because this is your result. Um, so right now, um, you have a pretty much a full comprehensive dashboard of every 911 call that has came in today. So it refreshes every night at, um, it refreshes every night at 12. And if a call was to come in, it would refresh and um, update the numbers within the dashboard. 
so um, as you can see, uh, we have heat maps and a lot of different other helpful intuitive things that help um, um, the 911 team kind of get an overview of what's going on in the, in the city. Um, this is, is so uh, some of the functionalities you have, you have the calls for service, how many active calls you have, can you dispatch, um, assign calls for service, traffic stops, and high priority calls. You also have a breakdown of, as you can see, the number is updated and the, um, the, the latest call comes to the top of the feed. Um, we also have a breakdown of how many calls a particular uh, precinct is received. We have that broken down, we'll have the um, now uh, high priority calls. And we also have a breakdown of how um, types of calls that we're receiving. Traffic stops, this was uh, implemented during the time that there was a big effort to, to see how many calls we were getting for, for traffic stops or near the highways or interstates. So what we do is once the, a call comes in, we evaluate and do a spatial correlation in regards to how close it is to a um, to an interstate. And then we present, if it is, it's marked, um, it's uh, attribute is updated and we kind of filter off of that attribute. And then we have the wards, of course. And then high priority calls, how many calls, um, types of priorities each uh, precinct is, is receiving. Um, also, we have a calls for service throughout the day. So they can kind of see, um, kind of see, you know, when your higher call times versus the lower call times and things of that nature. So that is Edge Frontier, our Edge Frontier integration. So now we present, now the first two, first two sections are, are kind of present what GIS does and how it positions us to um, become the, the vehicle for the city of Memphis, become a smart city. Now that we, we understand how we, are, we, we do our data and take in our integration capabilities, now we want to try to take a look at that, that plan and see how we can kind of assist in that effort. So the, if you've not heard, the Smart Memphis Plan is a um, began development in 2016 as a collaborative effort between almost all the departments within the city um, to use te utilize technology to improve the service um, to its citizens. So its purpose is as follows. Um, the purpose of the Smart Memphis Plan is to enhance the use, to enhance the use of digital technology data to improve the city's functions for serve, serve uh, and serve the people's businesses and institutions of Memphis. Smart City uh, focuses on the connecting of an array of systems from devices to networks to, um, to infrastructure and harnessing the data and technology in these systems to improve the function of the city. Um, of the city. Now that is beautiful. And it's something that we, we all strive to do here at the city of Memphis. But just to kind of Kind of focus on GIS. If you look at the things that I've highlighted, these are all things that the city of GIS, the GIS team is already doing. The use of digital technology, um, um, we institutions of Memphis, we are collaborating with all the city of Memphis, connecting our array of systems. We are already integrating with a lot of different systems that we have the capability to and we are uh, accepting the challenge to. And we are harnessing data and technology. As I stated, our databases um, make get 10K updates a day. Um, we are and all geared towards improving the city. So, how what is the city's approach to in the smart the smart Memphis plan also uh, details the city's approach to this is centralized and repeat. So the approach helps the city build a strong foundation and long term success by prioritizing consistent enterprise driven um, decision making across various divisions and agencies in the short term. So centralize and repeat, um, as it details in the document, it's all about um, basically getting all everything into one system so that we can kind of build off of that system and then replicating things that, um, that are working and kind of going away with things that aren't. So as the city of the city of Memphis EJIS team already does is we do the fact we have a central centralized SQL database that connects data from all different departments. This puts us in the perfect position to, to um, to, to host most of the city's data, as well as um, build applications in regards to the repeat, um, build applications that are quickly configurable and able to be uh, deployed in a very rapid fashion. Now, also, the, the smart plan also breaks it down into six, six different sectors, um, kind of detailed here, uh, transportation and streets, utilities, buildings, public safety and digital economy, and public 
public services and public services. Um, so these each one of these um, each one of these sectors also has its own uh, core values and goals, which is very cool because all it was was a checklist for our team to kind of say, okay, we can handle that, we can handle that. And here is an example of the one for streets and engineering. Um, so as you can see, some of the goals are, are things are using sensor technology to measure effects of uh, traffic calming measures. Um, some of them, and this one described 811 using the 811 data, which we're already integrated with. We have bike and pedestrian things bike and pedestrian goals that we've uh, already developed apps for for the bike and pedestrian team so it, it seems like when you look at the when i took a look at the goals and, and value for each department it really i really lit up because gis is so integrated with the city is that we already have a head start on a lot of this a lot of these different things so all we need is the buy-in from the departments as well as to see that we can help and assist in their in this in their and then reaching this goal. So to kind of sum it all up, going back to those values that are highlighted within the um, purpose, the use of digital technology. EJIS team already is a totally web-based platform in which we instantaneously, um, inst that updates instantaneously throughout multiple apps. So we are a digital technology. Um, institutions of Memphis, currently vital to the operation of 10 different departments within the city of Memphis. So that kind of puts us in a position to already um, to, to be working and collaborating with a lot of different departments. Connecting an array of, uh, of systems, as we just showcased, uh, we already integrate with a lot of different systems in an effort to provide more context, uh, build with different interfaces, and uh, make the department move in a more efficient manner. Harnessing data and technology. As you can say, um, our database ca uh, captures over 50K hits a day. That's not 10,000. Now, all of those hits are not updated. Only about 10,000 of those are updates, but our database get a lot of um, updates a, a day. So, and they're all geared towards better in the city. And centralizing repeat, um, our secret database is a host of the majority of the city, the city of Memphis' GIS data today. So, in conclusion, um, now that we understand that, um, 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 now, as you all know, GIS, um, as you all know, GIS is way more than maps. It's an ecosystem of geographic data that can be utilized in a variety of different ways. Um, the city of Memphis has a lot of, and Memphis in general, has a lot of opportunities for change and growth, which has gained momentum and is, and is up to us to sustain that momentum through collaboration, communication, and holistic thinking. Um, as these departments evolve better um, to better handle their issues, it is vital, and I mean vital, that GIS evolves with them to grow in any, in any fashion that we can to assist. So uh, with that being said, thank you for your time today, and uh, we'll open up for questions. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, or you are more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Also, thank you so much for that presentation. That was very, very cool. Uh, no problem. Thank you, Michelle. Well, if no one else has a question, I have a few. So, um, so you mentioned that there's the 311 app. Um, I don't live in the city of Memphis. Um, so, would you mind showing us that? How do you how do you find so, that? So, the three one one app is actually through C Click Fix. It's a, a third party vendor in which we've also integrated with. Um, so, we provided three one one a um, no three one one. We have a geo processing service that geo codes all the the service requests that come in through three one one. So, um, it's called Title C Click Fix. I can definitely find you the link to it, um, I don't have the immediate access link to it. Jeff, you got a question? Yeah, Joseph, that's, that's some cool stuff. Um, a lot of stuff going on with the smart cities. Tell me about how you're with the different departments, let's say public works, for example. What challenges have you seen and how are you able to get these departments on board with, this, with these new initiatives? Um, 
the challenges I've seen um, in regards to getting getting the, them on board is more of just it's the, probably the most difficult part Jeff, in regards to showing them. What I've learned is that we can we can sell them, we can tell them what we can do all day, but a lot of departments don't really buy in until you show them. So we have to somewhat be proactive about some of the things that we see that the department needs. Um, so for instance, we developed the dashboards for traffic signs and, and things of that nature. It was like, hey, we see that you guys are doing some, a lot of things in regards to um, in regards to fabrication. So we developed you a fabrication app. And then, so they'll play around with it. And sometimes they immediately pick it up, but sometimes, you know, it gets pushed to the side because they're busy. And then three months later, they're like, oh yeah, we do have an app for that. So um, the, the biggest challenge to, to eliminating, um, I mean, the biggest challenge to getting their buy-in is just, is pretty much, well, like I said, we just have to show them a lot. Um, show them rather than just kind of talking about it. I'm going to thank Jeff. Or I'm going to thank you for Jeff. He actually lost connection to the call. So, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so he will hear your answer. Um, okay. <laughs> anybody else have any other questions? I'm going to ask another one then. Um, so you said the 911 app uh, took about three months. So, and that the others don't necessarily take that long. Um, how long did each one of those take? So, LiveLink took um, actually, funny story about it. LiveLink was a proof of concept um, that got picked up like wildfire. <laughs> so, I think uh, BJ has said he had developed it in probably about two months. Um, Sam Sarah took a week. And then, what's the other one? Yeah, Sam Sarah. I mean, Google AI was just, once we sent them, it would took us only probably a couple of days to send them the service. Most of the stuff was on, um, on their end. But as soon as they sent the start getting flow in, one of another requirement popped up in which we need to remove all of the, um, we need to move all of the state routes because state routes go to TDOT. So that took us probably about another week to develop um, there. So all in all for the, Google AI development, like I said, with most of the heavy lifting being on the Google part, all we had to do was provide a service and then do a geoprocessing. That took probably all of like two weeks um, to develop. Um, and I will say the, the speed of development is truly due to the, the team. Um, it's not that, um, that these things are, are kind of, of are easy or things that the team, this team just has a lot of different experience. And that guys I just have a lot of different experience within the city. So it is um, truly a attribute to, how, to them, to how fast we are able to kind of integrate with systems. Are there any other questions? Um, so the 911 app, do you know if Shelby County has one like that? All right, you know, do you know if they have one or have you shown them yours? Um, I do not know if they don't, they have one. I do wish to collaborate with Shelby County a lot more. Um, it's definitely, we actually love to collaborate with a lot of other, a lot of other different departments and we're all open for it. Um, but I'm not sure what Shelby County has at the moment. I would love to show it to the E911 team um, up there and if there's something that we could kind of do for them to integrate with their system or if they need a dashboard of any sort, um, we would love to kind of collaborate with any of you. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, if no one has any more questions, I will save my questions and I will read <laughs> the rest of them. No um, problem. Thank you so much for your time. It was a great presentation and we um, are very happy that you were able to speak. So. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, everybody. We will see you again next month. Actually,
Um, next month is April, so we will be at the Tingic, Con Tingic Conference, um, and you can find that information on our website. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.